Uh, my name is Paul Drodos. I'm a uh, county commissioner for Goodyear County. And uh, part of our job as uh, the commission is to provide health and human services. Um, that includes most of uh, the needs of people who are in need. And uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, at a meeting we were studying some of the uh, statistics about our population and discovered that the uh, incidence of people requesting treatment for drug addiction was increasing tremendously. Um, in the past, uh, there was a competition between methamphetamine and alcohol, and in this case, methamphetamine, methamphetamine was actually winning that kind of horrible race. So it was our intention to immediately start discovering or studying this problem, and uh, that led to a program which we did last year called Needles and Pills. Um, that program was done, it was around Easter time, but the point was that it was extremely well intended, which showed that there was a great deal of need in this community. The outcome of that was that more people became aware of the methamphetamine problem by reading a book called uh, Six Years Lost, which was written by a local author. And also the, the big news was that we received a grant, a federal grant for uh, $500,000 to institute a uh, drug court, which we can thank Judge Bailey for working so diligently to create. Um, the further outcome is that we weren't really making progress, but we knew that this problem was very deep and very serious, and we also knew that before a wave crashes on the shore, this storm has been brewing out in the ocean for a long time, and I think we're starting to see the results of that. Anyway, um, the Needles and Pills program was brought to the community by uh, the City of Red Wing, uh, Goodyear County, especially the Republican Eagle, and the Duff Endowment, because they... Uh, they believed that people needed to know more about this problem, and in fact, we did learn more about it. We also learned that we're not making a lot of progress in this, in this problem, and that perhaps it would be a good idea to start exploring different avenues of understanding this. And in order to do that, um, I was approached by the University of, Mich uh, excuse me, the University of Minnesota in order uh, to follow through with an outreach that they're doing in their neuroscience department in order to actually find the um, source of these problems within the human brain. Uh, I was very excited about the prospect because we, we often talk about treatment, we often talk about uh, um, things like recovery, but we, fit, we often don't talk about the science and the actual physical aspects of drug addiction, which is so important to understand in order to solve some of these problems. So, in order to do that, um, I, will, I would like to uh, First of all, I just wanted to read something that I, I find really inspirational. Um, the, universe, the University of Minnesota is actually um, the sponsor of this program tonight. And um, on, to, on top of Northrop Auditorium, uh, and, and if this is actually engraved in stone, or chiseled in stone, the, the purpose of higher education is founded on the faith that men are ennobled by understanding dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, and devoted to the instruction of the youth and the welfare of the state. Those are some very important things as a society to remember, and especially, you know, the welfare of the state, that's all of us, and we really need to work together and learn about our problems in order for us to solve them. So, this evening's program is dedicated to the science and new research and uh, certainly new findings about addiction that are, are being, um, being presented by the University of Minnesota. I would like to uh, introduce Mark Thomas. He is a professor of neuroscience and scientific director of the Medical Discovery Team on Addiction, a new research program funded by the state legislature to fuel cross-disciplinary collaborations and discover new treatment options. His research examines how addictive drugs alter the brain and how these changes can lead to compulsive drug use. His lab is now focusing on ways to disrupt addiction relapse. This is some of the most exciting, interesting, and I think important information on this subject that I've ever seen or heard of. And I, uh, I, uh, I ask you uh, welcome Professor Mark Thomas from the University of Minnesota. Well, wow, that's one of the best introductions I think I've ever had. <laughs> thank you, Commissioner Drodos, for inviting me, and thank you for the work that you've been doing here in the community. Um, so my, uh, my goal here tonight is to, to talk to you uh, a little bit about the 
brain science of addiction. Um, to tell you about what we're doing at the university, it's my honor to represent the university and the Department of Neuroscience and our medical discovery team on addiction tonight. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll end up with talking about some of the new research that we've been working on um, for, from different angles to try to address this difficult problem of addiction um, using some of the results, recent results from our lab as, a, as an example. Um, so, I've compiled some st statistics here, some sobering statistics about the widespread nature of addiction, about the cost to society, um, and I'll, I'll leave you to, to, to look over those if you'd like to, but what, what we don't learn from these kind of statistics is the kind of personal cost that this disorder has for people, and, and, and some of you um, maybe know somebody who's had a problem with drugs or, or um, have had a problem yourself. Um, and it can just be devastating for families and, and for friends and for individuals. Um, and as we formed this team a couple of years ago, uh, we've been getting weekly emails from people saying, you know, my, my granddaughter, my son has tried everything to stop and, and nothing is working and what can you do to help? And it's, and it's really sobering for us and, and humbling um, to you know, have people reaching out to us like this. Um, there is a great need and um, it just fuels our passion further to try to learn more about uh, the, the brain's role in this and, and what we might be able to do to disrupt addiction, thinking about it from a biological perspective. Um, so uh, I just want to mention a couple things here in terms of different ways that we can think about what can we do as a society to try to disrupt this problem. And um, since the early 1970s, one of the ways that we've been trying to do this is to disrupt the supply of drugs available. And th this is basically what the, the war on drugs has been. And I, I think this is a really revealing graph here. Um, this is now a couple years old, but the picture hasn't changed. Uh, we spent a lot of money on this, but you can see that the, the rates of illegal drug use have not taken a dip. In fact, they continue to increase over time. And so this is, uh, this is troubling. Um, our, our main um, push to try to solve this problem has not succeeded. And as I said, this is mainly a that the solution attempt here has been to try to curb the supply of drugs. Um, and, and, you know, this is, you know, feeding into the, the further costs that we have for society in, in dealing with it in the way that we have um, has increased the cost of the justice system to the, you know, nearly to the point of breaking. And it, it isn't my point to say that, you know, that we should, we should stop all attempts to reduce the supply of addictive drugs, but um, that it's, it's not, it's not we, we, need to, we need something else. And, and, and one way to think about this is we have a supply problem and that we have, you know, let's take opioids for example, we have prescription opioids like oxycodone that are pretty readily available. Um, and we have now street fentanyl, that's an incredibly potent opioid that's you know, even more readily available. Um, and and we, we need to deal with those problems um, and, 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 and um, for example, if we had better pain treatments that weren't addictive, then we could reduce that supply to some degree. Um, but we really, I think we should be thinking about how we can wage a war on the demand. And that, that's really the, the goal that our group has is to, to think about this as a demand problem rather than a supply problem. Um, and so, you know, the first thing that might come to mind is that, uh, you know, in terms of the demand, people who had uh, traumatic experiences in life, um, who live in poor social conditions, whatever they may be, um, but that, that can inflame a demand um, for addictive drugs. And so we, we need to try to continue to focus on those issues in our society. But it's also true that these addictive drugs have very potent effects on the brain. And in particular, 
on parts of the brain that are important for our survival. And that's what I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about here. Um, I just wanted to point out that you know, at, at this, we formed this team a couple years ago, um, and I'll tell you more about that at the end, but our goals as a team are, number one, to lead the nation in addiction neuroscience research, and uh, we're making some real strides in this, in this area. Um, I, think, I think it's something that, that we can work towards that the state can really take pride in. Um, that to make rapid advancements in the understanding of brain mechanisms of addiction and addiction relapse, which is one of the important points I'll touch on later. Um, and to, to try to translate these discoveries into new effective therapies that prevent and treat addictions. And, and these might, you know, the, uh, of course, um, psychosocial treatments and things like 12 step and um, you know, those are going to continue to be important, I think, but we need more tools. And, and we, we need tools that are based on the biology of what happens to the brain, at least in certain people, when they're chronically exposed to uh, addictive drugs. And by doing this, we think we, we have a chance at disrupting the opioid epidemic. Of course, all of you know, and especially Commissioner Drodo's comments, that opioids aren't our only problem. And I think by taking this kind of approach, um, we, can, we can hit other problems such as methamphetamine, alcohol, um, and the like. So let's, uh, I always feel more comfortable when I have an image of the brain on the screen. <laughs> I'm, I'm a biologist of the brain. That's what my training is in. That's what my PhD work has been in. I've uh, been at the U since 2003, and I have a laboratory that studies uh, the effects of drugs on the brain. And so I'm talking to you tonight from that perspective, mostly. Um, so this, this might be kind of a surprising slide for you. Uh, so, so this is what a healthy brain looks like. This is a, um, a cross-section through a human brain taken, a living human brain, taken with a magnetic resonance imaging um, magnet. Um, something we're um, quite good at at the U. Um, this is what an addicted brain looks like. Actually, it's the same brain. Doesn't look any different. I like to think about it in terms of this analogy. We look at a, a motherboard for a computer here, and one that's been infected with viruses. You don't, you, don't, you don't see the differences um, looking at it in this way. And, and I think it's, it's important to think about this because you know, if you had brain cancer and you got a scan and there was a big lump in there, um, it'd be easier to explain to your relatives that uh, you needed some kind of medical intervention. Um, and, it's, and it's not the same with addiction. But that's because the nature of how the brain is changed is different than it is in some other disorders. You don't see it in a typical kind of structural scan. Now, the brain, um, in, in a, even you know, a severe um, opioid user, methamphetamine user, it, it, it doesn't degenerate the brain, but it does rewire the brain. And that's something that's harder to study, but we have the tools to study that kind of re rewiring now, and that's what we're focusing our efforts on. So just in the, in the most basic terms, if we think about what the brain does, um, it's, it's an entity that takes in sensory information from the outside, processes it, and uh, selects an appropriate behavior. And in that sense, it, it's, a, it's a very useful survival machine, probably the best survival machine that we know of. Um, but in, in some cases, when an individual's been exposed to traumatic uh, events or perhaps to um, chronic uh, exposure to addictive drugs, that, that the processing changes such that rather than being directed towards things that will improve an individual's survival, you're directed towards uh, something that, that, that does not, in fact, can harm you. So where does, that, where, where, where does that processing happen and where can it go wrong? So uh, this is a diagram of uh, about 60 odd years of work in neuroscience 
trying to figure out what parts of the brain are involved in directing an individual towards rewarding, what we call rewarding stimuli in the environment. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we learned um, that there was such a map and um, what the components of this map um, are. So first of all, what, is, what use is this reward system? It helps to direct our behavior towards advantageous stimuli in our environment that is advantageous from the perspective of survival. Um, so towards, towards food or stimuli that predict food, um, it's that predict opportunities for sex, for building social networks. So this, this system evolved um, as, as really the core of this survival machine of the brain kind of lead the individual towards um, things that were useful. So how do we learn about that circuit and you know, that where it, you know, what, what, how do we learn that those components existed? And really, a lot of this work comes from work with animal models in the lab, so rats and mice, and that's something that we have a lot of experience with. That's where most of our experiments are done. Um, and, and the, it really all started back in the 1950s with a group up in, in uh, Montreal. And those of you who've had uh, Psychology 101 probably heard about this experiment. Um, so Olds and Milner and their colleagues implanted electrodes into the brains of rats. And they asked the question, you know, what would happen if they stimulated the brain? And this is not the kind of electrical stimulation that would produce a seizure or something like that, but a very fine degree of electrical stimulation that would um, just excite the neurons that were right in the area of that electrode. And what they found was that if they asked the question, will a rat press a lever in order to get this kind of brain stimulation, that there were parts of the brain where the rats would press hundreds of times over hours and hours to get this, to give themselves an electrical stimulus in the brain. So this was a, it was a really surprising finding at the time. They didn't know what they were going to find, to be honest. This was one of, one of these experiments where they thought, well, we're going to probe the brain and see what it does. And, and they found something incredibly um, interesting and, and useful that we've been now studying for the past six decades, um, almost seven. So uh, this is, I, I just wanted to give you an example of a, 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 a 2019 version of this kind of experiment that comes from something done in my lab, which is using light stimulation to activate specific pathways in the brain. So instead of using electrical stimulation, we can, through methods I'd be happy to describe later, install light sensitive proteins into, this, into specific parts of the mouse brain and shine light on the brain to see what its effects are. And, and, and the goal in, for us in doing this is try, to try to understand what kind of information is carried from one part of the brain to another um, and, and in which way we can learn about this reward circuit and the different parts of it and the functions that those different parts have. So let me just show you this this little video here. And uh, so this is a, a mouse that every time it enters into this corner, it gets light stimulation in a very specific part of the brain of, of the reward circuit. This is the first time it's been in this box with the light on. And it's found that there's something special about this corner as compared to the others. The light doesn't appear when that's, that's a computer generated think for our own purposes, but you can see that the, there's a little cap on the top, and that's the, the, when that light comes on, um, that's when the animal's getting stimulation. The point here is that over time, he spends more and more time in that corner. So there's something rewarding about that light stimulation, and it's a reward that comes not from a natural reward in the environment, like availability of food, it's reward that comes from a specific activation of a specific part of the brain. So this is just the first time that the, the, the mouse has been exposed to this, but if we, if we let him do this over days, he'll spend his whole time in the, in the corner over there getting stimulation like that. So, um, so uh, just a couple more 
words on this little example here. Um, there are all sorts of different pathways, as, I, as you saw in the human diagram. Now this is the rodent version of the reward circuit. Okay? Um, and so one of the goals of, of some of the work that we and others have been doing is to map out what are these different connections in the reward circuit? What kind of information do they carry? Um, and so in the example that you just saw, we were stimulating specifically the cortex to the nucleus accumbens, just a, a, a very specific pathway in the reward circuit. So, so just each one of these has the capacity for carrying all kinds of different information about rewards. But one of the, the most classic examples of this is um, the, the uh, neurotransmitter dopamine, which maybe many of you have, have heard about. So this, um, you often, if you read it, an article in Time Magazine or something, it's, it's the pleasure molecule. Um, we, we don't think of it that way. In our, in, we think of it as the survival molecule, the do-it-again molecule. Um, so this is, do dopamine is a neurotransmitter in this reward circuit. And I, I just like to use this example of uh, the amount of dopamine that's released when, um, and in this case, a, a rat is given, um, a hungry rat's given a pellet of food. You see this blip of dopamine. But look, look at the degree of change in dopamine that you get with a single exposure to amphetamine. It, it's just, you know, almost 10 times what you get for, for food. And, 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 and we know through lots of experiments that with the meaning of dopamine when it's released is that you, you want to, um, to, 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 do, to, um, to, to do this experience again. Your survival depends on doing this experience again. Um, and, and so with that as a kind of backdrop, when you think about now, one of the chief effects of addictive drugs is to increase dopamine signals in the brain. So whether it's cocaine, amphetamines, nicotine, um, or opioids, all of them have different kinds of effects on the brain, but they have this one in common. That is to enhance dopamine signaling. And if, if we're right, that dopamine signaling means do this thing again because your survival depends on it, it, it puts a different kind of spin on what drugs are about and why people would take them. And I mean, often we think of like that there's, I mean, there are euphoric effects that come from any of these drugs. But there are other effects that may even be um, unconscious. So you're not aware that what your brain signal is, it, the, brain, the signal that your brain is getting is, do this thing again. Your survival might depend on this. And, and so that, that's, that's uh, it's, I think, uh, to me, something profound and something that's important for us to try to understand. Okay, that's, that's the Neuroscience 101 part. Uh, I, I should, maybe I should stop and take any questions on that, though, before I go too much further. Yes? Is there any difference between hey, genders? Oh, you got it. Is, is there any difference between genders when it comes to this? Yes, yeah. Okay. And, and that's a... a, a it's good. Yes, it, the, I mean, it, it's a hot topic of study. The question was, are there any difference in males and females between any of these things? And, and there are some pretty profound differences. Um, and mostly, at this point, they've been studied in mice and rats. So we're trying to figure out, are they the same in people? Um, for example, their, their um, cycle, um, um, cycle differences in, in females. Um, with the, um, hormonal cycles uh, that, can, and under some conditions, make um, dopamine signals enhanced and other ones suppressed. Um, but it, I, I think as important as it is to study the differences, the commonalities are quite strong. Um, and so there's been a recent focus on s studying the differences, but I think it's important to remember how similar both males and females are in many of the things that we study. Yeah. Yes?
Yes, my question is, is there a difference between pleasure seeking and pain avoidance? Because lately I've looked more at a theory of it's more pain avoidance that they're trying to avoid their suffering in life than pleasure seeking. I, I think there's a third way, <laughs> and that's a, so. So, I, and that's a very important question. It's a, it's a it's an important thing to think about whether there's um, a, a seeking of a reward, as we would call it, um, or avoiding the pain. Um, but I think that there there's a, a, um, there, the other way to think about it is that there's a signal in the brain, the dopamine that I was talking about, that's saying pleasure or pain, you do that thing again. Uh, and so it's, it's in some ways it's not, it's not related to pleasure or pain. It's related to a kind of built-in survival signal that we had to pursue something regardless of you, what your sort of emotional sense is about it. And I, I mean, I, I don't think those things have to necessarily be, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, but I, I do think it's important that, to get the message out there that, that there's, this, there's this third thing. And it's a thing that I think it's, we don't have conscious awareness of it. And so that's what makes it so challenging it's because um, I think if you, if you ask somebody, why did you do that? They, don't, they might not have that as an answer, right? Um, and, and if they gave you that answer, you, you'd probably look at them funny too. <laughs> not you, but I mean, I mean it doesn't, it, it's not something we're, we're typically thinking about, right? Um, any other questions? There'll be plenty of time later, but I um, just want to, I thought, uh, rather than put you all to sleep, I'd get some, get some questions going here. All right. So, um, so what we want to think about, you know, what, what is it that we can focus on as a research group? Um, what is it that we can try? What, what specific sub-problems in addiction can we attack? Um, and, and the uh, chief one that we're looking at is to try to understand the addiction-related brain patterns. Because if we discover what they are, we can think about ways to intervene and disrupt craving and, and relapse. And I mentioned relapse earlier, but it's really a key part of addiction in that um, so many people who, who are able to get clean, it, it, it's very difficult to stay clean. Um, and maybe clean isn't even the right term. I mean, but um, to stay abstinent. Um, and so the, these are some, some statistics from the National Institute on Drug Abuse from a few years ago. Um, and it makes an important point that if you, if you get beyond a certain point of, of being drug free, um, that it's easier to maintain. But it's, it's still, there's a, there's a pretty high rate even after long times of, of being drug free. And so something we'd like to understand is what, what signals are there that, or what triggers exist in the brain that can be tripped, that can take somebody who has been you know, 10 years sober um, and um, you know, make them susceptible to cues in their environment, to um, drug re-exposure that can, can um, cause them to relapse. Um, so again, here's the, the reward circuit, and a part that we know from a lot of work now in neuroscience that's involved in this relapse effect is here in the nucleus accumbens, which is a, a chief uh, place where dopamine is signaling in the brain. And so we've, we've uh, started to, to do some work focusing on this area. This is uh, the little red portion here is the, the nucleus accumbens in the human brain. And when we see um, this, this it, something I didn't point out before, that the, the reward circuit in the human brain and in the, the rodents and the mice and rats it's laid out in a very similar way, so that the, the components um, interact with each other in, this, in the same ways. If you look under a microscope at the neurons in these areas, the individual brain cells, aside from the size of the cells, the shape and the way that they um, uh, connect to other cells, it, and then the chemically the way they signal, very, very similar. And you can't, you can't really tell the difference at that level between a rat brain and, and a human brain. 
So there, there's a lot of hope that we have with this kind of organization that what we learn from the, the animal experience that will, or experiments will be able to apply to people. Obviously there's a lot of work in between, but that's why we spend so much time doing animal experiments. Um, and so one of the experiments that we've been doing that we're excited about is to, to look at how opioids uh, like morphine in our case here, but um, like fentanyl, oxycodone, heroin, how, they, how do they affect the brain and how do they affect behavior? Um, so what we've done kind of a simple um, opioid treatment here, we're just giving once per day um, an opioid for five days, wait for two weeks, and then look, look at the brain using a, um, a, a functional magnetic resonance imaging scan. So this is something that the University of Minnesota is a world leader in. Um, we have uh, the, what's called the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research, which has some of the best and biggest magnets in the world to make brain recordings from living um, animals and people. Um, and so, it, surprisingly though, we haven't really put these tools to use um, in addiction neuroscience, and so we're really working hard to, to, to put these to use. And this is one of the early experiments that we've done to look at the effects of chronic, in this case just a five-day exposure to opioids. And one thing that we find here that's, that's highlighted is that the prefrontal cortex has a stronger connection to the nucleus accumbens in the opioid treated rats than it does um, in the control animals that didn't get any drug. Um, so this is kind of surprising um, that, that there's a stronger, you think, okay, things are degenerating, they're getting weaker, things are, no. So you know, this is the, the, the interesting thing about the rewiring that happens in the brain. Um, in some cases, there's stronger wiring that takes place, and, and that's what we're seeing here from the frontal cortex to the nucleus accumbens. So what we wanted to try to, to knowing this information, what we try to try to do is to look at the behavior of these animals and then think about it, if, if, if there was some way that we could undo this kind of brain change that the opioids made, how that might influence the animal's behavior. So the, the very kind of simple model that we use in this case um, is called condition place preference. And the idea is that we're, we're providing kind of an opium den for the, the mice. And so um, in this uh, initial phase of the experiment, they wander back and forth in between these two different zones in the environment. They don't mean anything to them at that point, so they spend equal time on either side. But if we pair opioid exposure with one of these sides, so keep the animal on this side, give them a morphine injection each day for a week, um, and, and, uh, and then give them the opportunity to wander back and forth, you see that there's this increase in the amount of time spent in the opium den, which is perhaps not too surprising. Now, um, what if we put them back into the environment and don't give them any drug? What happens over time is that they lose their preference for this uh, drug paired side. So now they, they just spend equal time on both sides. But if we give them a drug injection again, they'll go back to sp spend their time on the, the, in the opium den. So this is a, what we call a relapse test. Obviously it's a simple model in the lab, it's not necessarily have, has all the you know, factors of relapse in, in people in the world, but this is a, a simple way that we can assess the animal's behavior and, and see whether or not we can modify that. So the way that we tried to modify that is through neurostimulation with light of the kind that I showed you earlier. So in the case I showed you earlier, um, the animal was in, in charge, basically, was self-administering these light pulses. Now, in this case, we, we administered the light pulses, and we administered them in a way that years of research has told us will modify the synaptic, the strength of the synaptic connections between two different brain areas. So, in other words, turning that um, opioid brain into one that looked like the control brain. We, we, we were able to reverse the, um, the, the increase in the connection that we saw. 
in the opioid brain. And that's, that's what these data show in a much more complicated way than I need to express here. So giving that neurostimulation, we were able to reset the brain after the opioids had been administered. And the question was, what does that do to the, to the behavior? And what we found was that this is the typical opioid relapse effect. But in those animals that had had the neurostimulation, that blocked the uh, relapse effect. Um, and this is the, the summary over uh, um, many different animal subjects. It was published now a couple of years ago. Um, so this got us really excited because the idea that um, you know, we might have found one of those nodes in the, the neural circuit for reward that's modified by drugs and that if we could reverse that change that drugs had done that we might be able to block even with the, the um, exposure to opioids again, I have to stress that these animals that had the neurostimulation, they got opioids again, but they just didn't respond. They didn't go back to, to seeking. They didn't go back to the opium den. So that was, to us, exciting. Um, obviously, there are a lot of steps in between doing something like this and using this as a therapy for people. But being at the University of Minnesota and the group that we're building, um, we feel like we've, we've got a really good pathway to try to take uh, data like these and turn them into something that could be useful for people. Now, that's not going to happen overnight. Um, it's going to take time and it's going to take money. Um, but we're, we're building a, a group and, um, that can, can do this sort of work. And how would we do this sort of work? It's going to depend on things... Uh, uh, resources that we have at the university, like the imaging center that I told you about, um, like um, interactions with our community um, of um, neural device or device companies like Medtronic um, and uh, St. Jude and others um, who are working on uh, stimulators. They, they've had a lot of experience in working on stimulators for cardiac um, but now they're interested in, in uh, working on neural stimulators. And they've actually been doing this kind of thing for years. And probably many of you have heard about the success in the Parkinson's research field and the Parkinson's therapy field. Um, we're using what's called deep brain stimulation, which is implanting an electrode down into the brain, into motor centers. And stimulation through that um, can reduce the kinds of tremors that um, Parkinson's patients have and, and people for whom the drugs are not very effective. This is an incredibly effective therapy. Um, in Parkinson's, it's a, it's a little easier because we know a lot more about the motor centers than we do about the reward centers and, and, and the, how addiction is, is related to changes there. So that's what we, we need to know that information so that we can put it to better use in, a, in therapies. So what are some other things that we're working on as a group? Um, Non-addictive pain relief, I mentioned earlier. We had ways to effectively uh, reduce pain, those intense kinds of pain that can come with cancer, for example. With non-addictive therapies, that would be a huge boon because we just, you know, we could reduce that supply of opioids that we have. Um, addiction targeting vaccines is, is a new interesting area. Um, and we have one of the world experts in this area who's developing opioid vaccines that, um, that people could take that are so specific that it, it, could, it could wipe out fentanyl in the body um, without touching, um, you know, if somebody did have pain and they needed to have opioids, that they would be able to be given something like oxycodone that would still be effective. So this, this would be a way to, you know, prevent overdoses, I think, if we were um, successful in, in developing these kinds of vaccines that were safe for use in people. So those are, those are some of the projects that the group is working on. I just wanted to quickly introduce you to some of the people who, who make up this group um, without going through all of what they're doing and all their um, research projects. But we, we've been fortunate to get money from the state uh, to, to start this team. And, and then really our mandate with that was to hire uh, people into this area to build this group. 
And so in the past two years, we've hired 11 new faculty members, um, and which is, in our world, like you know, a huge boon. It's an incredible growth period. Um, and what we chose to do was really to go after those uh, the best possible young researchers that we, we could get. Um, and we have people here um, from, from just great scientists from all over the country who had offers of jobs at UCLA and University of Michigan and um, you know, University of Pennsylvania. But they chose to come here because of what we're building. Um, so but these, are, these are a few of the, the new folks who are, who are joining us. And we're so, so thankful to have them here. They, they just started in the past couple of years, as I said. So we're at the point where we're, we're just there. They've all arrived. And we're, we're you know, sorting through what sort of collaborative projects we can work on. There's a lot of excitement, enthusiasm in our group. And we're just uh, thrilled to be working on this um, difficult problem with some real optimism, though, about things that, that we can do. And uh, I thank you so much for coming out to hear about it tonight. Um, that's all I have for you for now, but I <laughs> would love to take your questions of any kind. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor. Um, I think this is some marvelous information. So. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic around. Just if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll start over here. Your, one of your last um, graphs about the relapse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm asking if maybe that's the reason as time goes by and we have so many people trying out so many different drugs. If one doesn't work, we'll go to the next one. You talked about supply and demand. Um, I'm aware of two people recently that were denied um, withdrawal drugs, you know, sublingual, mm -hmm. because you have to be able to go through withdrawal. So that targets those areas that, that helps them go through withdrawal. I'm now aware of two people who don't go through withdrawal. Huh. They can drop everything for a week and go on a trip and come back and start all over again. Interesting. So, what can you, is that kind of what you are saying? I mean, with this relapse um, graph or not? I'm just curious as to what is going on there that, that on occasion, and I talked to a law enforcement um, person, which thankfully many of them are here. Yes. But in another town, and they said the only way that they're seeing for those people to, to get, go through withdrawal over time is to put them in federal prison. I mean, it's that severe that they're seeing people just aren't going through withdrawal. Huh. They go through rehab, they're so, able to sustain it, and then boom, go back to the same levels. Yeah, so that, that's a really interesting story. And it, it just reminds me to, to point out that I mean, there are um, a lot of individual to individual variabilities in um, drug responses. And not only to individual drug responses, but to the collective response over time um, to the brain and the, how that would be manifested in the body. Um, and so the fact that some people might have withdrawal symptoms that are not as severe as others in some ways isn't surprising. I don't think I've ever heard of that the, there were none at all. But um, the, um, the idea that, uh, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before before it started. Um, the, the the replacement therapy drugs for opioids. It, it's I understand it. There's, there's it's a kind of in some ways a controversial issue in, in the society um, that you could you could replace one drug with the other. Um, from a medical perspective, and the people that I talk to in, in our clinics and, and surrounding clinics in, in the Twin Cities and in, indeed across the, across the world, um, it's, it's a pretty useful tool that we have to be able to administer things like methadone, like suboxone, to, to get people off of having to search for the, the drug in, um, in uh, ways that are troubling for them and for others. Um, these drugs don't provide the same kind of high and they don't provide the same kind of um, 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 just 
brain uh, effects over time either. And so th th there's a real utility in using those. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it, um, from a medical perspective, it's, it's pretty important to, uh, to have those as, as useful tools. I don't know that it, it so it doesn't quite relate to to what and that was the short answer to your question that I could have given right off. Sorry about that. <laughs> if I can formulate my question, um, has there been any research on the biological connection to people with addictions? Um, I went to a couple classes where some classes would say that some people that are addictive personalities a biological gene tend toward that, and I wondered if there's any research on that. There is quite a bit of research on that, actually. Um, it, it, like many other, all other psychiatric issues, um, the specific genes are incredibly difficult to identify, so despite many years of work, finding the you know, a set of genes that might confer susceptibility to one person versus another has been very difficult to find. But um, there is pretty clear evidence that there is a genetic component to it by doing things like twin studies. Um, you can, and, and even twins that were separated at birth so that you can see those kind of um, genetic effects. Um, yeah, so there, there is a, there, there, it's clear that there are biological factors, but what those factors are, we still don't, we still don't know. Okay, and yeah. I may have answered this question already, but when you're looking at a brain of people with addictive behaviors, mm -hmm. and if their families have addictive behaviors, is their brain looking more so different in that area? So this is, this is... Um, Without looking at the DNA. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the functional brain scans of, of the kind that I showed that we had in the rat, um, those have the potential to show differences, but it's, it's very hard to do these experiments in people, which is something I should have mentioned earlier, um, because people have different brains to begin with, and so it's hard to know, you know what the drugs did and what you know, their brains looked like beforehand, because they don't usually have a before and after. It's very uncommon to have that. But, in, but in, the, in the animal studies, we can look before and we can look after, and so the experiences they had in between um, will relate to whatever changes that we see in the brain, which is something that we're, you know, as we continue to kind of use these approaches, we can get at those questions a little bit more directly then relating them to people, we'll have a better idea of what to look for in people to see whether or not that's different in the way that it changed in the, in the rodent brains. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, doctor, how about, oh, excuse me, I'll tell you right yeah. um, How about um, something like um, dopamine fatigue? I mean, a lot of times you hear about uh, the effects of amphetamine. Methamphetamine being so strong or so overwhelming yes. that the brain can't recover, or that all of your senses are skewed because of that, just the intensity of the amount of dopamine. Is that true? Or yeah, what, what? yeah, there is some truth to that. It's, I mean, it, you know, it, it takes some time and energy to produce the dopamine that, that the brain needs, and so when it's when it's released to such a degree as it can be with methamphetamine binges. Um, the, the brain can't keep up with that production, so that can be an issue. That's right. Is, is that reversible, or what is your research showing about any of those? Yes, writings? yeah, and, and our particular research doesn't th th touch on that, but, I, but others uh, have, have spent some considerable time studying that and seeing that it can improve, and it, and it can return to normal. Um, and so, in, in you know, in, Re pertaining to the dopamine effect per se, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those triggers for relapse aren't aren't there. And then that's I think um, you know one of the challenges in terms of the, the, trying to study and treat this is that it's this chronic relapsing disorder. Hi, 
I really appreciate your uh, your thoughts on dealing with the demand problem, you know, and, and looking at how much money the government has spent on waging war on drugs. It's, I think, crucial to get across. In your last slide, you were talking about drugs that are not addictive, so but still being pain relieving. Mm -hmm. So my question is, I'm wondering, a couple of them that all are together, yeah. are, are, are there such drugs? Why would the pharmaceutical and doctors make those drugs when they're not going to be addictive? You know, because that's part of the problem is in pushing the medication. And um, how does that work then if if they're not if the dopamine levels aren't being like having fun? Yeah, yeah. How do, how does that work then? Yeah. So so that's some good questions there. Um, so the um, the pain system is a separate, it, it's, a, it's an interacting system with the reward circuit, but, it, but pain really, the neurobiological mechanisms are quite different than reward. So it's possible to target those pain um, mechanisms quite specifically without touching the reward circuits. That's, that's, that's uh, what the research is telling us. And so that I think it, it, it's quite possible that to, to try to find drugs that would reduce pain without hitting the reward circuits. And, and, and in fact, there are combinations of drugs that are looking effective. Um, and some uh, developed at the University of Minnesota uh, that are currently um, on their way into clinical trials, so not yet there. Um, and it takes apparently about 10 years for things to get from, from very promising results from the lab to something that could be uh, approved for use in people. Um, so it, it takes a while, but there, there are some really promising um, avenues with um, new pharmaceuticals coming from university labs. Um, is that answer? What does it look like to shift from a war on supply, if you will, to a war on demand? I mean, you start with the research, mm -hmm. but can you, is there a way to? You're not a you're not a forecaster per se, but is there a way to sort of? You mentioned the ten years. Is there a way to sort of say, okay, well, what would this look like if we decided to shift as a society to a war on demand? Yeah. Well, I, I mean. From my perspective, it's a, it's a shift in how we think about the problem as well as what we do to solve the problem. <laughs> um, so you know, I, I think the more we learn about the way the brain works, even the healthy brain works, um, it, it, it will help people, to, it's my belief, it will help people to understand the problems that we have with mental health, and I would include addiction in one of those. You know that there's that there's a physical, biological basis for these things is just important, I think, to to understand, and it gives us more um, compassion for those who are suffering. Um, and I mean, and, and and then practically, it gives us avenues where we can mitigate that suffering. You know, um, so. For me, the war on demand, I mean, it, it, it's a lot to do with doing this kind of work. But it's also, um, you know, coming to that realization and getting that message out there about the biological basis for these things. I have a question about your opiate replacement, you know, the medications like Suboxone or Methadone. Yeah. I'm just curious, what does the brain look like? Just say somebody is taking Methadone uh, for a couple of years, and you said it doesn't have the same effect on the brain, but mm -hmm. it quiets that searching, I guess. What happens to the brain? What does it look like when they go off that medication-assisted therapy? Yes, that is a really good question. And I, I am not aware that there are really good data on that, which seems kind of ridiculous because it's an important question. And um, so we, one of the people who we hired onto our team, we actually hired her away from NYU where she was um, doing great work, but she saw what we were doing and, and came to join us. That's the kind of work that she is planning on doing. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, her name is Anna Zilberstunt. 
um, you know, I'm really excited about you know, what she might find in looking at questions like that. Because what we're, what we're hearing from the doctors in the clinics, um, they're saying, you know, if if we take people off of methadone or we take people off of suboxone, um, they look pretty much like people who hadn't ever been on it. You know, I mean, so you know it, that, that there's there's an effect as as the drug is present, but after after that drug is gone, um, you know, it wouldn't have mattered that they were on it. That that's that's in, in terms of like the clinical features, but in terms of the brain, we would like to know that question too. So sorry, we don't have the answer yet. Hi. Every time somebody relapses, um, does it change the chemistry or the wiring of the brain? That's a really good question. And um, there, again, are not great data to address that specific question. What we do know is that, um, that the, it, it It, it mostly looks the same way each time um, in terms of you know, how we could look at it in the, in the mice and rats in the lab, that um, you know, we would see the same kind of uh, neural effects um, each, at each relapse um, that we would see in the first one. But, but really, you know, looking at it carefully in the way that you're, you're asking about, we, we haven't, we and others haven't done that yet. It's a good question. interested in knowing if uh, you're seeing any correlations between uh, depression, anxiety, SSRIs with regards to the research that you're doing. I'm interested as somebody who deals with depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, in my 20s and 30s, I was a chronic marijuana smoker, mm -hmm. which in some respects as I reflect on it was the self-medicating mode as well as recreational. Mm -hmm. And now with the advent of SSRIs, I don't smoke marijuana anymore, but mm -hmm. just curious, because a lot of what you're talking about in terms of the, the way the brain is operating is a lot of what I've come to learn about how my brain is operating with regards to depression and anxiety. Yep, yep. and there, there are a lot of similarities. Um, so, um, you know, even at the level of the animal um, models in the lab of depression and anxiety, which are kind of challenging to do in mice and rats, to be honest, but, um, but we, there are some, and we see some of the same brain changes with a depressive-like rat um, and, and uh, you know, an opioid-treated rat. And, and some of the new research is really trying to look at, you know, are, are, do those things influence one another? Um, which is something we, it, it seems that they should from what we, we see in people, and it's not only opioids, but it could you know, be, be marijuana as well. Um, but, but we'd like to know at the level of the brain, you know, how do those things interact? Like, um, there's, there's a lot of um, discussion about how, um, in data, that um, trauma during childhood could change the brain in such a way that might um, make one susceptible to um, becoming addicted more quickly um, with exposure to drugs. And, and so it would you know, be, be nice to know, um, you know what the brain signature of that kind of trauma might be so that we could look and say, okay, you know, this, this person is going to be susceptible and, and maybe there's something we can do to prevent um, them from, from being addicted later. Um, but there, there's a lot of interaction between other psychiatric conditions and addiction, and it's a big topic of research, but because we don't understand any one of them, the, the combinations get even more complicated. <laughs> and so in some ways, that, that research has been kind of slow to get going because um, it, it gets very complicated when you combine things. Doctor, could you uh, just give us an estimate? I understand that the legislature has uh, given you a grant, a grant to the university. Could you 
just give us an idea what that, how much that grant was for and how long it will continue? Sure, so that, it started in 2015 and it was $30 million. And as I mentioned, the, the money was really to, to hire these new rising star faculty. Um, and so we, um, we, we're, we've done pretty well in hiring them and so we're, we're spending through that money pretty quickly for that, pur for that purpose. Um, um, and so we, we feel like we're off, to, we're off to a good start. The next phase for us, um, we have money to hire uh, two to four more faculty members um, so to fill in some holes in our expertise. Um, but the next thing is to really go after large federal grants that will help us to support the, the research that we're doing because um, the money from the state isn't as much to support the research, it was to, to build this group. Well, thank you very much. I think while this audience is here that it would be uh, appropriate to give maybe a little update on uh, some things that the community is doing. Oh, sure. Um, I think the drug court has certainly been something that we can all be proud of. And Kate uh, Olmstead, is she still here? Yeah, of course she is. Would you come uh, up just for a moment and just uh, tell us a little bit about your work? Kate is the uh, new administrator for the drug court, and I'd just like to uh, have people get a feel of what the uh, community, and I also want to thank law enforcement for uh, Sheriff Marty and certainly Chief Bowman just being here to share with you this evening and share this information is, is so important that we have a community along with the uh, county attorney and uh, the judge, we're all just delighted that, that we're not facing this crisis. The government is very involved in this, and, and we know how important it is. But, Kate, if you just want to explain a little bit what you do, and uh, I think people would be very interested in that. Hi. We, as a county, now have a treatment court. It started in mid-April. Right now, we can have 25 participants. Right now, we have six or seven. What we are doing for the next four years of this federal grant is to reduce recidivism by helping and also supporting. We're not going to send these defendants to prison. We are going to help. So instead of just doing treatment, treatment is only the first thing that we're doing. After treatment, if they come back or after prison, they come back. If they have no support system, no job, no driver's license, what is that doing in our community? They're going to do exactly the same thing that they know what to do. So that is what we are doing in Goodhue County to help. Um, we will help you find a job, find housing, find support groups. We found some great support in the community and also what we're looking for is other people to help. Even. I guess what we're trying to do is also do an individual approach. We always say, your story is different from my story. So we have some participants who have great families. They have that support. They need other things. They might need therapy, but they also need a support system and not just their family. We have people who don't have a great support system. They come from a family that really has nothing and they're just continu continuing that cycle. So now we need other support people to come in and help. You might not be able to help with donations, gift cards, gas, that sort of stuff, but we're also looking for people that will come and come to court, say hi. If you're out in the community, hey, do I know you? Or just simply calling once a week and saying, how was your week? Some people need that. I think me and Judge Bailey were just talking a few weeks ago on, you know, I have a great family and a support system. I have parents and friends. My friend came last weekend and brought me coffee. You're having a hard week, Kate. I thought you needed some coffee. Immediately, my mood changed. Wow, that was awesome. What are we doing with our participants that don't have that? Even as little as that phone call, as little as, hey, you did good this week, here's a $5 gift card. Here is a thing of toothpaste. Those, those little things don't mean a lot to maybe somebody who has that, but somebody who doesn't, it does. 
So that's really what we're looking for. Right now, our four-year grant will help us help over 25 participants, but they have to have um, felony drug charges right now. And also, they're non-violent offenders. So I don't want people to think, oh, these people in drug court are violent. Not at all. Not at all. And most people that have a substance abuse issue aren't really actually violent. They're violent when they're doing these drugs. So that's not the type of people that they are. Let's see. Um, I guess in our community, this is only going to be going on for four years with our federal grant. After that, we need to show that we have done such a great job in Goodhue County that we need state funding and county funding. So that is our goal in the next four years, is to get it up and running and to help as many people as we possibly can because then those people are going to go out and help other people in our community. That's my pitch. That was a good one. Yeah. Are there any questions yes. for Kate? Where, where are you, where is this located? Where, where is your headquarters for this? We're at the courthouse in Goodhue County. Thank you. Yep. Um, there was talk at one time about an inpatient treatment center. Is that in the process yet? We're hoping so. Um, I know that I have somebody here from Common Grounds who has been really working on that. Um, a few of the places that were a possibility are no longer. A lot of the problem is um, not in my neighborhood, not on my front porch step. You know, I live in a great neighborhood, but I found out that there is people of substance abuse two doors down. So it is already in our neighborhoods. But right now, I don't know if we have any other possibilities going on right at this moment. Um, I have a question about utilizing current community support um, to, with your agency. Uh, Faith in Action is a volunteer group who helps people in need who are, you know, have cancer and other needs. Is that something that your office could tap into? Yes, if they are willing to, that would be fantastic. The volunteer yep. group, they're pretty yes. nice group. Some of these yeah. would love a chat or somebody to come next to them, or really, they don't have a driver's license, they just need to get five miles to the courthouse to make these groups or to make their NA meetings, that sort of stuff. I think so, that yeah. would be good, thank yeah. you. Hi, I don't know if there's a question for you or, or for the commissioner, but um, in our community there's only one um, one area that will help you with your medication. Um, and uh, she has been with us, Tori, uh, her name is uh, Amy Torres, and she works at the Hiawatha uh, Valley, and that's the only doctor that we have that we can get medication from. And I, um, been t I, was, I went to see her and she said, come back in two weeks. They couldn't schedule me for a month and a half. I, I was sitting in the, in the receptionist area and they were declining new patients. They didn't have any, any more room or any time for any new patients. Why is it that we can't get any more medical help for our medications? I think there's just an abundance of people who need services and we just don't have enough funding to go around. Um, I specifically don't know that answer. We do have a few people from Health and Human Services that may be able to help. Yeah, hi. I am from Health and Human Services, social services specifically, and there actually is another prescriber within the mail system in Red Wing, which is Dr. Proctor. And the way that Mayo has done that is triaging people. So he kind of gets people on their psychiatric medications, gets them shored up, and then sends them back to their primary doctor so he's able to see as many people as possible. And then Amy Torno is with Hiawatha Valley Mental Health Center. Um, my understanding is that they're not that far out with the psychiatric services, but the um, therapy services, they are out. 
And so there is wait, and that is not um, unique to Purdue County. We have wait all over the state, if not all over the country. Um, psychiatric prescribers are in great need. Um, there are, in the surrounding area, there are other, there are other psychiatric providers um, in, in Rochester or the South Metro area. So if you have questions about providers, our social services intake often takes questions about um, resources and referrals and we could help you out with that. Um, there's no one to hire out there. No, there's a workforce issue. Um, this area typically struggles a lot to, to hire mental health professionals because we're competing with the Rochester area and the metro area and where Goodyear County is, we're kind of in this triangle. And so mental health providers typically struggle a lot to hire professionals in this area. We also are not a college town, and so you look at towns of Winona, they're kind of breeding grounds of people in their bachelor's degree going on for further education, then they're able to retain those professions, and we don't have that here in Goodyear County, so we're trying to strategize to find some unique ways of bringing those mental health professionals here and making this a community that people would like to live in or live close by. So it is a problem, and I'm sorry that that experience is tough when you're in that seat, when you're in that waiting room. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think this is uh, coming to an end. First of all, could you give your contact information because if people are interested in either the drug court or being associated with that or volunteering? Yes, of course. If you need to get in contact with me, um, you can just give the county attorney's office a call and they will give out my contact information. Um, <coughs> If you have any ways that you could help or any suggestions, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. And finally, I, um, I did want to give some thank yous. I think the Republican Eagle has been very vigilant uh, in their first degree uh, amendment um, responsibilities to inform the public about um, this problem and bringing people together to discuss it, understand it, and hopefully do something about it. I want to thank the University of Minnesota for this outreach because uh, how, otherwise how would we ever know this is happening and how there, that there's progress being made. So I'm very grateful for that. And of course I want to thank the doctor. But before I conclude this, I, could you possibly just explain your educational background as far as how you came to this and just, just a little bit about what it takes to be a brain surgeon or a brain doctor. <laughs> I'm, I'm a mouse brain surgeon. <laughs> Um, so I, I um, started out as a economics major, um, but I became a biology major and found out about neuroscience and heard anything about it until I took biology 101 in college and my professor was a neuroscientist so he got me interested in it. I was in Santa Clara University at the time, but they didn't have a neurobiology program and so I transferred to the university or to Northwestern University in Chicago, got a degree in neurobiology. Came back here for a year to work in a lab at the University of Minnesota, and then um, I'm from here, um, and then uh, went to graduate school at UCLA and got my PhD in neuroscience there. Um, then did some training at University of San Francisco, uh, California, San Francisco, UCSF, Stanford, University of Michigan, and then I made my way back here as a faculty member. So I, I, I had a lot of different training in different places, and I appreciate all of it. Just met a lot of great people. So. We were under the impression you were no slouch doctor. So <laughs> we're also thankful that as a professor, he certainly knows how to put together a presentation. This is all information that hopefully in our lives we can use, and uh, I guess we're also depressed by this issue that having any ray of hope or light or just the fact that there's progress being made or that we're coming at it in a little different uh, area is important. And uh, I'm so glad you all could come out tonight. There's, a, there's an awful lot of things going on. The weather's great and there's a lot of excuses, but we all know in our hearts that this is such a serious problem. We can't even let up on it for a minute. We just have to remain, as we keep saying, as a united front against addiction. We have to understand its symptoms. We have to understand it's progression and most of all we have to understand that addicts are human beings that need our help and that there are things that can be done and should be done and once again it's the role of government to help people come back to this society and uh, I thank you all for your attention and uh, your excellent questions and I again thank uh, the doctor 
for just being an interesting and very informative guest. So thank you. Very thank much. you. Have a great evening. It's still light out.